Hello, everyone. Welcome to class six of our uh, ray tracing course. So, um, before we begin, let me read you this ACM SIGGRAPH policy against harassment. This live stream is moderated by ACM SIGGRAPH. We ask that all comments stay respectful of others and respect ACM's policy against harassment. This means to exercise consideration and respect in your speech and actions, refrain from demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior and speech, and please be mindful of your fellow participants. All right, so we are in the home stretch. So this is class six, so we have one more to go. And um, today we'll be continuing looking at the BIDF and start combining the things that we have learned so far. And before we do that, uh, we have a guest today. Uh, please uh, welcome uh, Keith Morley from NVIDIA. Hi, Keith. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Thank you for taking time to be with us today. Of course. And, uh, uh, to start off, um, I'll ask you the same thing that I ask everyone. It's like, can you describe a little bit of background, like how you are, where you work, and how you got interested in rendering, and what has been your journey so far? Uh, sure. So um, let's see. Right around 2000 or so, I was an undergraduate at the University of Utah. Um, wasn't specializing uh, in anything kind of general computer science. And I happened to take a uh, software engineering class from one of your previous guests, Pete Shirley. Um, and he taught software engineering by having you write a render. Um, it's a great systems level uh, project to learn on. And I fell in love with ray tracing at that point. So uh, I became an undergraduate researcher for him. And uh, you know, back then, Pete was, you know, working really hard on popularizing a lot of things that weren't so popular at the time, such as ray tracing and bounding volume hierarchies. Everybody was using KD trees and ESB trees and um, trying to see if we could make path tracing and ray tracing practical. Uh, back then, we were only thinking about batch rendering, uh, really, nothing interactive. A lot of our work was done on huge SGI shared memory supercomputers. Um, you know, if you hook together 64 SGI processors and a huge multi-million dollar machine, you could get interactive frame rates on, uh, you know, literally dozens of or hundreds of primitives. So, <laughs> um, and yeah, at the time it was kind of a backwater of research, but I just I loved it, and so I just did it because it was it was a, it was a hobby for me. So it became an academic pursuit. Um, after grad school, I went and worked uh, with you at Disney Animation Studios for a couple years. Um, and then I did a ray tracing based startup with uh, Steve Parker, who's at NVIDIA, and Pete Shirley. That uh, startup was purchased by NVIDIA. Um, you know, we became some of the early uh, workers on ray tracing at NVIDIA back before uh, RTX, um, back before most of the studios were using uh, ray tracing, you know, for, for everything in, in film um, and trying to see if we could make it work on, on GPUs. And I've been doing that now for uh, getting close to 15 years. NVIDIA. Wow, that's that's awesome. It's like uh, you follow your passion right from uh, undergrad years and now you're um, practicing it in industry. Um, and you mentioned RTX. Um, um, that has um, been like a huge um, leap forward in terms of uh, bringing interactive ray tracing to everyone. Can you describe a bit about like RTX, what it is and what uh, it can do? Sure. So for for the first years that uh, we were working on ray tracing at NVIDIA, we were developing APIs to kind of create an abstraction layer to allow ray tracing on the GPU. But you know, it was really just a CUDA kernel under the hood, just a CUDA kernel like every other CUDA kernel out there. So kind of general purpose GPU programming on the SM, the streaming multiprocessor. Um, and so there's a ton of algorithmic work at that point. Um, and you know, life was good. You know, we could found that we could get really high parallelism and good performance. Um, but you know, then we we decided to go a step further and a lot of research went into it and seeing what what could we do to make ray tracing practical and a hundred times faster than it is today on our, our hardware. And what came out of that was a special purpose uh, ray traversal and intersection unit uh, called an RT core, uh, which sits alongside the SM now. So whereas everything used to happen on the SM before, so shading, um, you know, scheduling work and traversal were all kind of competing for the SM. Now we have RT cores sitting alongside the SM, so shading can happen on the SM, and it communicates back and forth 
with the RT cores, which does all of the, the traversal and the BVH and the intersection with, with triangles. So it, it um, kind of divides the workflow in two and, uh, and a lot of just substantial speed ups that have really, really kind of taken us to the next level in performance for path tracing. Oh, that's awesome. So uh, we've been using um, RTX cards and the performance is totally amazing. So uh, one of the um, uh, things I hear about is like the, the programming, the GPU is hard and then uh, directly writing code with CUDA um, is, is a little bit difficult. Uh, so you have a, a library, um, Optics API to help uh, writing ray tracers. Um, can you describe a bit about like what how it interfaces with CUDA and the RTX cards? Sure. Um, first, I should say that uh, you know there was there was kind of a an evolutionary design change uh, in the Optics API a couple years ago, and so it used to be that Optics was an API that allowed you to provide scene data um, and kind of tell Optics how you wanted to handle memory. And Optics did a lot of work under the hood to manage memory, to just in time compile uh, kernels out of you know, your programmable shaders and internal kernels um, and then run on the GPU. But a lot of the, a lot of the, what went under the hood was kind of hard to intuit about and hard to really, uh, you know, especially as people became more and more used to programming kind of high performance programs in CUDA, they wanted that same level of abstraction for a ray tracing API. So we completely rewrote the API, has a lot of the same concepts, but now it's much more tightly integrated with CUDA. So really what most optics uh, programs look like now is an, uh, a CUDA program with this kind of special subset API, uh, the Optics API, which uh, allows to specify uh, scene elements um, and geometry, textures, all of that stuff, as well as uh, programs that can be used to generate rays, shade rays. Um, and of course, Optics does all of the traversal and uh, intersection under the hood for the most part. Um, so that's, that's out of your control, but everything else is under the control of the user. So it's a lot like uh, uh, programmable shaders and the old raster pipeline, how they revolutionized things in the early 2000s. Um, you know, we handle a lot of the, the difficult work under the hood to really efficiently use new hardware. Uh, you write the shaders and focus on the algorithms that you care about, um, and together we get you know, really high levels of parallelism. That's great. So, and then uh, what is, um, if you can describe, like what are the current things you're working on? What's next for Optics or RTX? Um, yeah, so as I said, the Optics API became a lot lower level. So memory management is handled by uh, the users now. You have really fine grade control over um, scheduling host side threading, um, you know, streams, which is a CUDA concept of, that's similar to threads where you have streams of execution. And you know, so you do a lot of that high level scheduling yourself. Um, one of the things I've been working on lately is developing a library, some of which will be released um, open source or source available. Uh, built on top of the Optics API that uh, gives a starting point for researchers and engineers to do more complicated tasks like, um, you know, texture paging. You know, texture paging has been critical in the film industry for years, as you know, uh, in order to, to use only the textures that are needed when they're needed in a render to keep the working set down. Um, this is the type of thing that's a little bit more complicated on a, on a GPU uh, because the transfer across a PCIe bus um, complicates things a lot. The smaller memory space on the GPU complicates things a lot. So we're writing helper libraries to, to do a lot of this work. In addition, you know, we have uh, partners and uh, studios that always want uh, more functionality, more uh, hardware. Right now we support triangles um, in hardware, fixed function. And, you know, we're being asked for more and more uh, different types of uh, intersection primitives. So we're kind of researching into that, seeing what might be feasible. Um, more uh, scheduling algorithms under the hood to get more uh, performance out of the GPU and ensure parallelism. And a lot of our work lately has been on really tightly integrating the Optics API and its environment into the um, excellent suite of CUDA tools for profiling, debugging, um, and um, in introspecting on your programs. So you know, you, a lot of what people are scared of with uh, GPU programming is kind of this lack of this robust uh, tools environment um, could has come a long way on that for the last few years and optics now is, is being able to leverage a lot of that so that you really can see a lot more into what's going on under the GPU and really optimize and get the, the most out of your application. Okay. That's great. And then for you mentioned studios and then we also hear a lot about like games starting to add um, uh, ray tracing um, 
to render. Uh, how is that different or how is that done? So, uh, yeah, so Optics was the first real ray tracing API at uh, NVIDIA. Um, as performance got, uh, got better and better, we became more ambitious and started looking more towards interactive and real-time uh, workloads and possible use in games. So instead of just one API now, we have uh, three core APIs, really. Um, Optics is the CUDA-based API. Uh, there's DirectX ray tracing, the DirectX API, and there's Vulkan RT, the Vulkan API. Um, Vulkan and DirectX uh, ray tracing APIs are kind of tightly coupled to, the, to those systems and, and uh, are form of kind of a better tool set for, for game programming. They don't have all the flexibility. Uh, there's some limitations compared to Optics. Um, but they all three live on top of a, a common ray tracing uh, core library. So you know the the way they abstract, uh, kind of abstract and lay out uh, user programs is very similar. It's not too hard on the device side to take a uh, application written for uh, optics and translate that over to uh, DirectX RT. The host side APIs are very different, of course, because uh, you know all the memory management and and the, those APIs are are quite different. Uh, but the core ray chasing operations look pretty similar because really they're all you know fairly lightweight wrappers over a common common library. That's great. And then, um, how can our viewers uh, get uh, RTX card? This allowed us to <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm. I I don't have a a, a three thousand card of my own yet. So I mean, I've got work cards, but I haven't been able to procure one myself. So yeah, that's a that's a tough tough thing right now. <laughs> And then the advice for people like just um, beginning to get into the field, into ray tracing, um, uh, what should they read up on? What should they use as samples or other examples? Um, I, I guess I would say two different things. One, if you're really interested in ray tracing, write a render. I know everybody's done it and there are a thousand out there, but it's really what got me passionate about it and uh, what what allowed me to explore the space because there's so much kind of niche research in, in rendering right now. You know, and maybe you'll find that you really are interested in, in uh, acceleration structure research or in VREF or, uh, you know, camera models. There's so many different things. So if you write your own renderer, you, you kind of learn a lot of the basic math and, and structure. It's a really good system programming exercise. You can kind of feel out which areas you'd be really interested and passionate about. The other thing is, you know, cast a wide net with your, uh, your, your education. If you're really interested in compilers, do that. I mean, uh, when we're hiring for the optics team, you know, ray tracers are great, but uh, you know, people that know ray tracing, I trade two of them for one that's really good at compilers. Um, Cause you can teach ray tracing, but compilers <laughs> are really hard. So, you know, and nowadays it's all system programming, you know, so there's, there's tremendous amount of data that's being wrangled. There's just in time compilation, um, you know, low level hardware architects. So there's really whatever you're interested in, is in uh, computer science right now, of course, machine learning and AI. Um, you can, if you have an interest in, in, in ray tracing and rendering, you can tie almost anything into it. Um, so write a render, find what you're interested in and uh, really focus on that. Um, and as long as you're doing something you're really interested in, you're gonna be good at it and, and you'll get hired. I mean, every place is looking for render developers right now. So um, they're, they're hard to come by. All right. Uh, thank you again for uh, being with us uh, today, and uh, thank you for the valuable advice and insights. Yeah, thanks for having me. Take care, Rajesh. Bye. Bye. All right, so that was Keith, and he had some solid advice for all of us. Let me share my presentation with you. All right, so this is class six. Um, again, last time uh, we covered a bunch of things, um, materials and BRDFs, and uh, today we got some view of um, what um, what a large system uh, like Optics um, can do, um, what kinds of things it supports. So we'll um, do a little bit more of uh, that learning, and then um, we'll dive into um, more of our BIF, so we we'll continue kind of uh, combining um, the lessons we learned uh, separately, but into a, a single uh, program. So you'll see 
how the reflections we did, how the diffuse we did, and then we combine that with the BIDFs that we learned. So slowly we're trying to build up the system so it does everything instead of being isolated on one sphere that we were trying to do. So that's what um, we will do today. So Keith um, described a little bit of um, the NVIDIA optics architecture. So, um, so any kind of um, modern ray tracer that is used for a lot of uh, primitives um, would have parts or architecture similar to that, um, that we ultimately think become more of a system um, programming or um, high performance computing uh, kind of thing because ray tracing, as you saw, um, can be really expensive to compute because of um, um, the number of samples we take, uh, number of rays we generate, um, number of um, uh, depth uh, uh, loops that we have to make. So all those things kind of uh, compounded by multiplying with each other and uh, things can get really, really complex, especially when you have a very large scene um, so our scenes are really simple. Um, we have spheres, which are easy to compute intersection with, and we have just a handful of spheres. So we don't need these, uh, um, this kind of uh, uh, architecture uh, yet. But as soon as we start adding like very general purpose, uh, the triangle intersection, and all our optics are composed of hundreds of millions of triangles, and the scene itself is composed of, again, millions of objects, then these things become very important. So you need to be as efficient um, in your scene traversal um, so you can break the initial part that we do. So scene traversal is basically uh, going through your entire scene, a, a list of objects, and then um, that becomes um, cumbersome because now you have this big for loop that you're going to go uh, go through each of your objects. So what most of the ray tracers do is they have some kind of uh, an acceleration structure. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And then once you start traversing the scene, you uh, generate these rays. And so you'll have to generate a bunch of rays. And in order to be efficient, you can um, you want to be coherent because as rays bounce, so one ray is far away from the other. So you want to kind of maybe even collect uh, rays that are going together in a bundle and then trace them together. Um, the third part is the intersection. So intersection computation is, uh, um, for spheres, it was pretty fast. And then for triangles, it is fast too. Not as fast as the sphere one, but um, it's pretty quick. But you have millions of them. So um, you want to be as efficient as possible. And then um, even in the big red tricks, they will do the same thing where you want to find the head, you want to find the closest head, and then you don't know if um, you have any object or, or not at all. So, so you can uh, see that the same kind of structure that we use, that that's uh, available in, in all kinds of um, rendering products as well. So let me uh, talk a little bit about texture structures. So uh, on like uh, trying to uh, send a ray and trying to set up we don't each topic separately. We can do some kind of a hierarchical bounding volume. So we can say uh, enclose the entire scene in say a box and just intersect with that box. And if if um, we have a hit, then we break that box into multiple boxes and then uh, you can start hitting each of those individual boxes and uh, try to find out if there is an intersection. So the box um, hierarchy that you put on top of your scene, that helps you um, accelerate this um, uh, intersection or traversal scheme. So, so most modern ray tracers will have some form of a um, structure like that that will allow you to um, to traverse the scene more efficiently instead of just going through a loop uh, and traversing all the objects. So the second uh, part what makes um, uh, ray tracing quick is that you can have instancing. So many um, scenes that you see that are complex, they are essentially replicas of uh, multiple objects many times. And as long as you have some kind of a affine transform, 
you can uh, instance it without duplicating geometry altogether. So that makes it um, very efficient. So if you see vegetation of some kind where leaves are instanced uh, instead of being duplicated, um, or you have even whole branches uh, then be instanced and rotated and put in some way so that uh, it is still just an instance rather than a full geometry copy. So that reduces the geometry load um, on the ray tracer and that makes things um, as fast as possible. So acceleration structures, efficient intersections, instancing, um, all those things combined to make uh, rendering faster. So we're not going to be doing um, these things, but you just want to keep that in mind that those that as you as you progress further and then you start adding millions of objects in your scene, you can uh, start doing that. And it's uh, fairly straightforward. If you use optics and you have RTX, you can use that directly because it's available in the API. And otherwise, also you can use uh, other third-party APIs to do these things, something like Embry. Um, that also allows you to make that in the CPU. Um, and then um, it's not um, hard to make one yourself. So I think you can read up on the literature, making a simple acceleration structure is fairly straightforward. Again, as I said, you can have these hierarchies of bounding volumes that encase your scene. OK, so let's get back to um, where we were in the coding of our ray tracer. And um, we talked about materials. So um, diffuse lambertian surfaces. Um, we talked about mirrors, um, where we have a perfect uh, reflection of the ray around the normal to the object. And we talked about something in between, uh, or more on the glossy side, more on the mirror side, where you have um, a shape, uh, something like that. And in general, we said that uh, things are more complicated, and you could have different kinds of materials, even materials that are semi-transparent, where uh, the rays can go through it. Uh, and usually, uh, we deal with them mostly on this upper F hemisphere. So math is a little bit easier. And then you can use um, um, Snell's law or other things to figure out the refraction side of things. Um, and we, we did program on the two cases where we had diffuse and we had a mirror. So when you want to combine these two things or, or you want to have a more generalized BRDF, you can imagine that there will be lobes like this for different kinds of material. So instead of, um, uh, instead of writing um, exact code for each specific material, we can generalize it a bit and yet uh, cover many cases so that we can intermix these values of um, um, BRDFs into uh, creating new kinds of materials uh, just from a few properties. And as an example, we talked about the, the Disney principle uh, physically based BRDF. Um, which, which allows us to do that. And then many BRDFs are kind of based on the Disney BRDF or very similar to that. And sometimes you would uh, have BRDFs that uh, take into account um, um, the transmission side of things as well. So, uh, so things, um, um, but they all kind of do something similar. So they are kind of generalizing many materials where you can then compose using properties any kind of material you want uh, or most of the materials that you can think of. So um, once we start generalizing, we can compute the BRDF of any material. So you want to create a metal, you set the metal uh, component uh, of the BRDF to a high value. And then you can set the color and other properties, uh, and then you'll get uh, metal. And you can even have um, varying materials. So you can have a rest spot on a metal object, uh, which you can set up as a, uh, as a texture. You can um, have um, essentially any kind of material you want and mix it in. Um, so it can be like this complicated uh, figure where you have all these samples um, uh, that you can take from whatever material you want or a mix of materials. So let's pause here and see if you have questions so far. All 
Right, any questions? So I'm being told that uh, my screen is a little choppy, um, uh, the, the streaming. Um, and I don't know why that is. I think the internet uh, seems fine at my end. OK, so if there are no questions, let's uh, continue on. So, so you think like now we can just um, create these materials. And um, when we hit an object, we ask what material it is. And uh, we compute the BIDF, and we're done. So, so that's not enough, because I think the main purpose of the BRDF is that it tells us that which direction the ray should go after hitting. So in this case, uh, we said uh, the uh, mirror is going to perfectly reflect the ray around the normal. In the diffuse case, we said we don't care. We, it reflects in all directions equally. So we just pick one direction or none at all and just to use the cosine rule to figure out the, um, uh, the contribution of that uh, light. So, um, so those two uh, extreme cases, they were easy to do. But when you have a BRDF, you need to not only compute it, but then it will also tell you where to go next. So based on whether it's a glossy material, you want to go in this direction um, of the mirror-like object. But if it's a complicated thing, you want to choose a direction that is going to um, um, give you the least um, variance. I mean, ideally, you would want uh, to go in a specific direction that is dictated by the BRDF. Um, in um, practice, that is hard. and um, because you need not only to compute the BRDF, but then you need to figure out uh, which direction to go to. So uh, that is um, what we would call uh, sampling the distribution. And that gives you the new direction to get to. And then you evaluate the BRDF usually. And uh, when you get a result from the BRDF, you um, you attenuate the result with the probability density function. So uh, when you sample the distribution, um, you would uh, get a direction and an associated probability of like how likely it is that this sample or this direction that I'm going belongs to the, P uh, to the BIDF. If, it, if it's a high probability, then it would contribute more to the pixel color if it's a low probability, uh, say, if um, again, these are not distribution. These are just shapes of the lobes. But um, you can think of, say if, say, if this was a distribution in this direction, and you chose a um, ray based on um, sampling to go in this direction, then maybe it won't contribute so much. But if you were to just go in right at the center of this lobe through it, and then it, that is a high probability sample that will give you the best results for that particular BRDF. So then the attenuation factor would be um, um, kind of low, or, or it would contribute more, because this would be a high probability event. So, so that's how you uh, compute uh, using the BRDF. Uh, so it's not just a calculation. But there are three things happening there. You get a new direction, uh, you evaluate the BIDF, and then you um, that evaluation is then attenuated based on the PDF um, or the probability density function. So it's um, so each each sub part of the BIDF uh, has its own probability density function. So there's no general rule to uh, tell you like how to sample the entire BIDF. So you have to do it separately for different components of the BRDF. And each of those um, gets a little bit complicated because of the math involved in there, because um, of the transformations, the specific shapes of how those uh, parts of the BRDF behave. So each of those have their own PDF. So each of them will have a 
way of sampling that PDF. Um, and then once you get the results, then you can attend by, by dividing the PDF. So, so that's well and good. But then you can also, to complicate things further, you can also have multiple components. Um, we can, if you have a diffuse and a specular, and how often you should choose between the two, that itself is uh, a challenge. So in, in many cases, people will just um, use equal probability. So if you have diffuse and specular and something else, you can one third of the time choose diffuse. You can choose one third of the time, you can choose specular and one third of the time you can choose the third one. And once you choose that and then you sample this BRDF and compute the BRDF and then um, uh, attenuate the, uh, the BRDF result. So you can do this equal probability thing, or you can uh, do something um, that is used in practice called multiple important sampling, um, which uh, essentially assigns weights to each of the sample. And um, it um, by then using those weights, you can um, uh, figure out like how often to um, go to diffuse, how often to go to specular. So, um, Again, things things um, get a little bit complicated, but the idea is should be straightforward and be understandable by you is what is happening. Um, and if it's not, then ask me a question and then uh, I'll, I'll try to answer it. Uh, we will not be doing multiple important sampling. We will do some BRDF sampling um, in, in the next class where we'll go through it, um, but we, will not be covering MIS. We will just use an equal probability to just choose between one of the many uh, uh, BRDF components. Any questions on that? So I hope this is clear, because people get lost in the PDF and the BRDFs and the MIS. So there are a lot of buzzwords here, but the ideas are straightforward, I hope. So are 100% Lambertian and reflective surfaces treated as a special case usually? So I think you don't have to. So they come out of the general BRDF. So if you um, look at the general BRDF code um, and then resolve those values for the special cases, uh, they are covered by that uh, already. So in, in practical terms, like no surface is perfectly diffuse. So there is always uh, some component that is um, um, that causes um, weird kind of behavior that you only see at grazing angles or in some other cases. Um, and that is covered by the VRDFs. Is the benefit of instancing saving memory, or can it also be used for faster intersections? So um, the main benefit is um, is saving memory. So intersections, um, uh, it, it doesn't speed up intersection. You still have to intersect with objects. How do we sample multiple materials in layers? Um, so, um, right, so I think what you can do um, is um, you can create textures instead of um, each, um, uh, instead of each parameter of the BIDF being a numeric value, you can sample it from a texture. So then it can be varying across the surface um, as much as you want, or you can, um, uh, create some kind of an average if you have layers. Um, so most, uh, mostly, uh, like, uh, we use textures um, a lot uh, for specifying different components uh, instead of using just um, numeric values directly, um, because that lets the artist kind of paint, paint the, uh, the varying properties of the material directly as a as an image. And then that image is then used by values instead of the color.
That is correct, right. So, so because we are doing multiple samples um, from wherever you hit, um, yeah, so that is true. Uh, we can um, get like uh, the same object and we um, can have different properties at the same place. So one other thing that we are not covering is, is something um, uh, also used heavily in production uh, quality renders is, is displacement. It's, uh, it's a different concept. Um, you can also paint displacement. You can specify it procedurally. So what that does is it, it perturbs the surface of the object slightly based on the values that you're providing. and um, that say a sphere, if you could uh, take a sphere and then at every normal, you could just push it out a little bit the geometry, then um, suddenly you don't have a sphere anymore. You basically have can break it down into a bunch of triangles and you get um, this uh, jaggedy ball. Uh, so displacement is used heavily for creating all kinds of environmental properties or, or uh, very rough textures. Um, and we'll also not be covering that because we're not doing triangle intersections. Um, and that basically can increase the level of geometry and but it also uh, uh, gives a very realistic look because for true displacement, you'll get these uh, soft shadows and this nice look that you normally don't get with smooth surfaces like um, uh, normal. All right, so let's continue on and see what we can program today. So I wanted to combine a couple of things from last time into a single place so that when we do um, the sampling of the BRDF next time, uh, it'll all come together. So let's take that step forward. So this shader I'm showing is available as a class six BRDF2. Again, my whole uh, point of um, doing this exercise is to make sure that 80% of the code each time remains the same, and then we just change a little bit. So it's all additive, uh, and we refactor a little bit, but otherwise uh, it shouldn't be like a drastic difference from last time. So we'll do this incremental changes and start combining things a little bit. So what I've done here uh, is, first of all, you'll see that there are now nine spheres. So I added. Um, in the make scene, I am making these uh, procedural. Um, procedurally, I'm just creating these nine spheres, and these are slightly apart. Um, and and you you should get used to kind of being able to create scene complexity procedurally by programming instead of hand placing objects everywhere, uh, because that can get tedious. Um, so. Uh, all I'm doing is um, just uh, on a grid of uh, three by three, I'm placing these spheres a little bit apart, and that's the offset that I'm using. Um, and each time it's a little bit farther away, and then we reset uh, the x and the direction um, after each loop, um, and then you reset the y and the z. So I'm putting the um, objects a little bit up in Y because otherwise, because of the perspective effect. So I'll show you what I mean. Um, they can get lost and you won't see them. So they're not just on a grid in, in a flat um, uh, Z plane, but they are uh, going up a little bit. So you can see more of them, that's all. So then I set material, but only for like the first one. So that would be your homework is to set materials for different things and uh, uh, see what they look like in different materials. So these are the properties uh, of the BRDF that I have set here. Um, and this time it's, it's like a complete implementation of the Disney BRDF. Um, so all I did was I took the code from uh, what Brent had provided on his GitHub uh, and then um, just uh, changed a few things so it compiles or works with the uh, shader toy. And uh, so it's all there. So it's like what we actually use in production. And um, we, I've set some values for the first uh, sphere. And 
and everything looks dark. Mm. That's OK. We'll fix that. So the rest of the code is uh, pretty much the same. Um, what we do, again, is like what every ray tracer does in the, for every pixel. Um, so every pixel part is provided by Shader Troy. So every, for every pixel, we um, take some number of samples. And each ray is going randomly about the center of uh, each pixel. And we adjust for aspect ratio. We fix our world so that everything goes from minus 1 to 1 from left to right, minus 1 to 1 in y. And uh, we are looking out in the negative z space. Um, we create a ray uh, starting from um, the origin. This is where our camera is. And um, we pass that ray uh, as a ray object and try to intersect with all objects and find the intersection object and the intersection point. And, um, and this is just some code to make sure that uh, Shader Toy accepts. Sometimes it I think it's uh, implementation of JSL on each platform is slightly different. So sometimes when I try it on my iPad, uh, things don't work. Uh, but whereas on the Mac, it, it, they work just fine. So some quirks about um, being strict on compilation. Uh, but that's OK, so we'll get around to it. If you're not able to make this work, let me know. I'll fix it somehow. So we find the hit coordinate of um, the sphere that got hit and the normal at the point of intersection, and we create a couple of vectors. And then we transform everything to uh, the tangent space, which is uh, around the hit point, because the BRDF calculation all assume that. Um, because the BRDF calculation should be independent. It, it always uh, of how your view system is set up. So it always um, does all the calculations in this tangent space, which is at the hit point. So um, ignore the slide visibility for now. So then we compute the BIDF. Again, we're not sampling it yet. We're just computing the value. And then um, we color, use the color that what we get out of the BIDF, and then with the normal to the light as using the angle, which is going to give us the diffuse component. Um, and then we tone map it and color correct it and add it to the sample and then after all the samples are done we average that uh, over all the pixels and if it doesn't hit anything we just say it's the background color and our background color is the modulated a little bit based on the ray directions it's um, it's kind of like dark blue to light blue from bottom to top so let's see what we've done so far um, and then um, one thing uh, that i added now is uh, we want shadows. So we want shadows. Um, and we, when we did refraction, um, if you remember, we hit, um, uh, we hit the sphere with the ray. And then we reflected that ray um, like um, directly around the normal in the uh, equal angle. And then we continued doing that. So we'll do something similar. But this time, instead of uh, reflecting it fully, we will direct it towards the light. So what we want to see is that if a ray from our eye hits an object, and then from that object, if it hits the light, that means that that light um, is visible to the object. So there is a direct line between the object and the light, which means the object is not in shadow. So again, straightforward um, geometry. Um, you hit a ray from the eye through the screen to the object, and then um, create another ray from the hit point to the light. And if there is no other object in between, it, it will mean that you can see the light, or you can see the light from that hit point. And if there is some other object in between, it would mean that this that particular ray is not able to reach the light. And we will put that uh, ray as if it was in shadow, because it is. And um, that's all. So that's all we need to do to figure out if something is in shadow or not. So let's do that. And so this is what we would code. We would um, check the light visibility. 
And what we would do is we will give it um, uh, the light. We have only one light in our scene. It makes things easier. Um, and we'll give the hit point and the normal at the hit point. And um, if the light is, we'll return 0 or 1. If the 1, if the light is visible, and 0 if light is not visible. If the light is not visible, if this variable is 0, we're just going to multiply it here, uh, and this whole thing will become zero, which means it uh, the color will become black. And what you would get out of it is a shadow black color. And if uh, light is visible, this factor would be one, and you would proceed normally. So this will should work like magic, and um, it is pretty cool actually. So that we have to code this thing, whether light is visible or not. So let's code this function up. So, so far, um, all I have is I'm returning false, essentially. Um, that's why everything is dark. So, so let's return the default value. And then as input, we have a hit point and hit normal. So let's code it up. Um, So you get the light direction, which is uh, the direction from the light location to the hit point. So this is, um, in the reflection case, we reflected it to get the direction. But we'll use this instead. So we will now make another ray. So the origin <coughs> would be the hit point. So ideally, the origin would be the hit point. Um, but sometimes what happens is these points are so close to each other that um, you get this uh, self-shadowing effect. So we we'll push it up a little bit in the light direction. So to avoid these floating point issues that happen sometimes. So so origin is essentially at the hit point. And the new ray that we are creating is direction would be towards the light. So now all we got to do is uh, intersect this new ray with all the objects. So if there is an intersection, which means some other object is blocking our path to the light, right? So we get this um, thing. So if um, sphere remains minus one, which means um, essentially um, object was hit, and light is visible, and we want to say visible equals true, because you're multiplying it, we're not going to use Booleans, so we're going to use floating point. So I'm going to say here. And then to start with, we should say the light is not visible. So that's it. So we have, let's compile this. There you go. It's beautiful. So now you have these shadows. So we are 80% done. And what we did in our make scene, we had nine of these spheres. And you can play with moving these objects around, changing the material properties. I'm setting the properties only for the first material, so you can see the specularity of the metallic object. Um, you can change all of these and see how they behave. You can move the light around to see how things vary when you change the light. And you see these shadows move. We will just um, try to see if we can 
add in something here that can move the light. So let's multiply it by the frame. Maybe slowly. There you go. So you should see the shadows move as the light moves. And you see some of these sparkly things that happen, and that's mostly numerical inaccuracies here and there. Uh, or maybe we have a bug we don't know about. So let's make this a little bit more slow. OK, so this is um, what we have. So we've combined the ideas from reflection to create shadows. And uh, we have the full BRDF. Again, the, all the code from that BRDF is from this GitHub. And it's uh, pretty much unchanged and all the way. So it takes care of all kinds of materials. And um, most of the other code is the same as before. And you can try adding more spheres. So I've added like a, try to add a nice sphere as a big base. So and then set it color to be gray. Let's try that. So essentially, I've added um, a large sphere uh, at the bottom, so you can more clearly see the shadows. So this ninth sphere that I added, or actually the 10th at index 9, is a huge sphere with radius 50, uh, which works essentially as a plane. And uh, this is the position of it. And we set the base color of it to be some gray color. And you can see the shadows move as the light moves. It's coming back on the other side. That is pretty creepy because the whole thing is a sphere, so you can see that it's changing. So let's stop the coding here. So next time what we'll do is we will then sample the BRDF and then try to send things in different directions. So what then you'll start seeing is interreflections between objects. Uh, you'll see this part of the sphere being reflected on the other spheres and uh, things would start becoming looking more realistic. And we may even try to create a dome. So there is a uh, half of the sphere, above everything, the texture on it. So that's how uh, you can do um, some kind of a atmospheric light um, that is pretty common um, with the actual production scenes. Uh, instead of like, having to create actual geometry, you can have a light that is essentially a texture. And you treat it as a light, and you sample from that. So one more thing we could try is instead of just returning zero, visible or not, we can return the color of the light. And then you can modulate the shadow with the color of the light as well. So you can try that. Um, uh, let's stop here, and I'll take some questions uh, before we end. We have some time. So let me save this so you'll have the copy that we have modified. Save. Excellent. All right. Is displacement the same as bump mapping? Uh, no. So displacement is. Um, actual displacement of the geometry. And when you have displacement, um, uh, it becomes more computationally expensive. So what um, sometimes people do is they cheat. Um, so instead of changing the geometry, uh, what they do is they change the normal. So because a lot of the uh, 
color information is calculating using the normals. Just by changing the normal slightly, you get a displacement-like effect, uh, but you don't get real self-shadowing because there is no nothing casting shadows um, because there is no displacement really. So bump mapping, you can think of it as a uh, as a cheap limitation of displacement, but it is super fast. So it's very common, and uh, a lot of um, um, objects would use that, especially things that are farther in the distance where you don't notice, but you still get some um, displacement-like effect. If you look at it up close, you'll see that there is actually no movement in the geometry at all. It's mostly um, a trick use, uh, using the normal um, perturbation. You can create this effect of displacement. More questions? So last time we had um, we had a um, one of our viewers created um, a nice um, sphere with uh, moving textures, and uh, it looks pretty cool. So Garrett, so he is going to get a book, um, the Ray Tracing Gems, which our, our next guest uh, who comes in on the last class, uh, he will hand out all the things that we have so far collected for three or four winners so far. So again, for the last lecture, I want you to create something awesome. And then uh, I think you have all the components here uh, to make any kind of scene you want and um, make sure it works with what we have done so far. Um, instead of looking at these uh, nine spheres, you can create nice complicated scenes. And you can even create a plane like we did. It kind of gives you the illusion of a plane. If you have a very large sphere, it essentially acts as a plane. Um, and then you can try to create some interesting scenes. So do that, and then we'll um, have the final winners again uh, in the next class. So let's stop here, and I will talk to you all next time. <laughs>